Hey everybody. Uh, in my last video, I briefly discussed some historical context concerning uh, the Jewish belief in the bodily resurrection, uh, not least due to the Old Testament doctrine of man. Uh, I wanted to expound on that a little bit more and, and really hammer that home because it's such an important point. And, and then I want to focus on the term eternal life or life of the age to come in its Jewish context and how these beliefs really go hand in hand. Okay, so again, we know that Jesus was a Jew and that Paul called himself a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee in Philippians 3.5. Now, someone might say that Paul abandoned his beliefs as a Pharisee because he counted as a loss what he had gained, but if we look at the context um, closely and cross-reference uh, that with Galatians 1, 3 through 5, uh, we, we'll soon understand that it's, it's his traditions and his status and rank in his religion that he gave up, uh, as well as his righteousness according to the law. There, there's nothing in the New Testament that leads us to believe that Paul no longer thought like a Hebrew uh, when it came to certain teachings like the doctrine of man in the Old Testament. Uh, it was to the Jews that God gave the or his oracles, uh, um, so he says. And uh, Paul considers uh, the Old Testament sufficient for correction. Um, therefore, when we interpret Jesus or Paul, or any Jewish writer for that matter, we, we must interpret them within the framework of how they thought. Uh, as well as how their Jewish audience uh, would interpret what they said. And this is basic to, to hermeneutics. Um, to, to the person uh, who would interpret the New Testament writers in a way that rejects their Jewish background in favor of, of Greek Hellenistic, a Greek Hellenistic mindset, um, he or she has the burden of proof. Uh, to show exactly when and how this occurred, because the evidence of this is is quite contrary. Um, for example, I'll just give a few scripture references here. Um, in Acts 23, verse 6, uh, I'll read. It says, Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, it is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. Of course, the scripture here would lead us to the opinion that Paul sees the resurrection in the way that the Pharisees see the resurrection. And in Acts 24, 14, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and in the prophets, verse 15, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Paul's hope is the same that those men that were standing by had. Again, another evidence that it seems that Paul continues to hold a pharisaical view of the resurrection of the dead, which of course was the was the normative uh, Jewish view, if you were not a Sadducee, of a bodily resurrection. Now, in in Acts twenty four fifteen, there there is an argument that uh, might would be brought up for the word mellow in a in a timing instance, and uh, I'll I'll get to that in another video. Um, but if we just we, we look at the at the context of what we're reading here, it seems that Paul still holds uh, a very Jewish mindset and belief regarding resurrection. Now I want to um, really really hammer this this point home. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote from Brad Young in uh, his book. Paul, the Jewish theologian, on page 123. 
and uh, I think it's a, it's a very enlightening quote, so I want to read that. In Greco-Roman thought, generally, the body was thought to be the prison of the soul. Evil matter is temporal, and the spirit is eternal. In Gnostic religious systems, moreover, the believer required special revelation knowledge to ascend through the dangerous celestial spheres to escape from the material universe. The god of spirits, sought by Gnostics, was not interested in the revival of dead bodies. According to their religious system, the material universe was composed of evil matter, which is contrasted to the spiritual realm. Greeks longed to be free from the confines of the body. While they did believe in the survival of the human soul after death, the notion that the body would be reunited with the soul in a physical resuscitation was foreign to their conceptual world. The Jewish people, however, believe that God created the world. Our physical world is God's creation, and it is good. The Pharisees, in contrast to the Greco-Roman religious beliefs, vigorously affirmed the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees stressed a literal resurrection of the physical body, which would be reunited with the spirit of an individual. Their worldview embraced a future restoration of God's original design for his world. The Pharisees envisioned a time of redemption in which God would realign the physical creation with the ethereal realm. And also want to uh, read something I got um, from an outline of, of a lecture on first century Jewish belief in resurrection uh, by N.T. Wright on this uh, pharisaical belief. It, uh, it read, uh, it was not a belief in the raising of, to life of a particular individual, but a belief in the raising of all the righteous to a new world where God would rule. It was part of the larger package in which Israel's God would create a new state of affairs in the space-time world, bringing about justice and people, overthrowing oppression and wickedness, and raising to life in order to enjoy this new day, all the righteous dead. Resurrection for the Pharisees was thus part of their belief both in the goodness of the created physical world and in the ultimate triumph of the justice of God. The rabbis, the successor to the Pharisees, even debated how God would recreate the new physical body. So I think it's historically um, set in stone, pretty much, that um, the Pharisees believed in a redemption of the creation, including the entirety of man, uh, a physical resurrection to a new world, and I think it's, in, in my opinion, pretty evident in the writings of, of Paul that he maintained this Jewish idea. So I want to reiterate yet again that when we go into the text to begin with, we need to have this in mind when we begin to exegete the text. Um. And now what I want to do is uh, start talking about what eternal life meant to the Jewish people when they heard that term and how it relates to the resurrection and the nature of the resurrection. And I'm doing a lot of reading tonight, um, but I'm going to read from... This book, uh, Theology of the New Testament, it's George Eldon Ladd. And there's a whole section on eternal life here. So uh, let me read, and I'm going to read a section called The Jewish Background. I'm going to skip around a little bit. I'm going to read some, some different sections. Um, and he has a lot of scripture citations here. I'll, I'll skip over them for now so that there will be a consistent flow in the reading. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> the exact phrase occurs in the Septuagint only at Daniel 12, 2, where it translates Haye Olam, the life of the age, designating the life of the future age after the resurrection of the dead. 
The basic meaning of life in the Old Testament is not immortality or life after death, but complete well-being in earthly existence. However, this well-being is viewed not as an end in itself, but as God's gift. To enjoy life means to enjoy the fullness of God's blessings and gifts, which include length of days, family blessings, prosperity, security, and especially fellowship with God. Keep that in mind. Therefore, the good gifts of God which constitute life must be enjoyed in relationship with God. Eventually, this feeling that life meant fellowship with God and the enjoyment of the divine presence and blessings led to the conviction that even death could not destroy this relationship, but that somehow the living God would enable his people to transcend death. This conviction, dimly seen at first, led to the conviction of the resurrection of the body and the life in the age to come. When the dualism of this age and the age to come emerged in Jewish idiom, the rabbis frequently spoke of the life of the age to come. So, when, when you read eternal life, which is very predominant in the Gospel of John, we have to understand it as the life of the age to come. And scholars with different backgrounds, you can check this out, they all understand this, that this is what it meant to the Jewish people. What it did not mean is that when you receive eternal life, um, you have an immortality from that instant on and that death, um, physical death, did not keep you from existing somewhere else in spirit. That's not the concept there when, when they received eternal life. Now, do we have the background of what it means in, in Judaism? Well, listen to what life meant in Gnosticism. The Hermetic writings represent an early type of Gnostic religious thought in which life plays an important role. Life belongs to God. In the first tractate, Poimandres, God is called mind, who is light and life. God first created the primal man in his own likeness, but this man fell in love with the created world and mixed with it. Thus humankind is twofold, mortal by reason of the body, but immortal by reason of the essential man. Thus humankind became ignorant of its true being and subject to death. Involvement in the material world means ignorance, which leads to death. If one can dispel his or her ignorance and learn his or her true being, by this gnosis that person will return to life and light. Gnosis is achieved by asceticism and by loathing the bodily senses. At death, one who has gotten gnosis ascends by stages through the heavenly spheres, giving up bodily passions at each stage until he or she enters into God, thus becoming one with God. The Gnostic concept, totally different. It, the Gnostic concept is man is really... It's, it's, a, it's about your spirit. Um, the Jew, Jewish idea of man is that man, again, is a psychophysical unity. The life or the soul is in the blood, and it drains away. You do not separate the two. Man is not a body, or man does not have a body. He is a body. Totally different concept. Uh, life in the Synoptics. The Synoptic Gospels also speak of eternal life, but here, as in Judaism, it is the life of the age to come. And what about eternal life in, in John? Um, in the fourth Gospel, life still retains it, its eschatological character. The usual Jewish attitude is reflected in the Jewish expectation of finding eternal life in the Scriptures. It was a commonplace in rabbinic teachings that the study of the Torah would lead to life in the age to come. When Jesus said that whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, he was referring to humanity's ultimate destiny. This eschatological character of life is most vividly seen in John 12:25. He who loves his life loses it, 
and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The Johannine form of the saying more clearly sets forth this antithetical structure of the two ages than the sayings in the Synoptic Gospels where the similar thought occurs. The fourth evangelist alone has given it a form which obviously alludes to the Jewish antithesis of the two ages. He who hates his soul in the Olam Hazeh, or this age, will keep it in the Olam Haba, that age, and consequently will possess Haye Ha'olam Haba, the life of the age to come. While eternal life is eschatological, the central emphasis of the fourth gospel is not to show people the way of life in the age to come, but to bring them a present experience of this future life. Here is a teaching that is not found in any explicit form in the synoptics, that the life of the age to come is already imparted to the believer. The purpose of Jesus' mission was to bring people a present experience of the future life. These two dimensions of life, present and future, are inseparately associated in Jesus' discourse about his relationship to the Father. Since God is the source of life, it is he alone who can raise the dead, but he has entrusted this prerogative to his Son. This mission of raising the dead is fulfilled in two stages. The hour has already come when the dead hear the voice of the Son of God and come to life. That this refers to spiritual resurrection, that is, the, that is the present experience of eternal life is proven by the words, the hour is coming and now is. The event of rising, rising into life is taking place in Jesus' ministry because the Father has granted the Son to also have life in himself. However, this present experience of life is not all that life means. The hour is coming when all who are in the tombs, that is, the physically dead, will hear his voice and come forth to the resurrection of life and to the resurrection of judgment. Um, let me skip over here. <clears throat> and there's more that uh, George Ladd speaks on this in the uh, chapter he has on eschatology. And I'll read it too. It says, After asserting that the hour has come when those who hear the voice of the Son of God enter into life, he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Here it is clearly affirmed that those who enjoy the present reality of life, who have been raised out of death into spiritual life, will in the future be raised out of the grave in a bodily resurrection. The clue to this is the omission of the phrase, and now is, which locates the resurrection of the preceding passage in the present and the addition of the words in the tombs, which gives the passage an unavoidable reference to bodily resurrection. And I would add to what he's saying that later in the Gospel of John, Jesus performs a miracle that points to this future reality in which he calls Lazarus forth out of the tomb. Makes sense to me. The one who believes in Jesus may die physically, but will experience the life of the resurrection. And whoever has life spiritually now and believes in Jesus shall live forever. This is from John 11, 25, 26. So when he says, you know, he who lives in me and dies, he will live. You know, he will be resurrected. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. He's speaking of the life of the age to come. In the age to come through the resurrection, they will never die again. This, this idea of... Um, well, let me let me read John six forty first, because um, this this gives an example of what he's saying about having this eternal life now, and it pointing toward a future reality. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
In the book of Romans, Romans 8, Paul says that if by the Spirit you are putting to, to death the deeds of the body, then you will live. The idea of a present reality pointing to a, pre, a present activity of pointing to a future reality is seen throughout the entire New Testament, I would say. And when you when you begin to understand the the two ages and that what Jesus has done is he's brought the life of the age to come into this age, it, it all begins to make sense. Um, let me let me refer back in reference to the ages um, and the resurrection and the age to come back to in my last video Luke 20 uh, the confrontation with the Sadducees um, verse 34 Jesus said to him the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. So to attain to the age to come, you do that through the resurrection of the dead. It's, it's almost like there's a synonymous parallelism in here when Jesus says, those who are worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead. So there, there is a now and not yet. But, but what is not yet will be when all come forth out of their tombs, as in John 5. And it's interesting because Jesus is, after he teaches them that the time is coming and is now here, where they hear the, the, the voice of the Son of God. And live, he said, don't marvel at this. And then says, there is an hour coming when they're going to come out of their tombs. Of course, this is what they believe. You know, if Jesus was teaching that, you know, this resurrection, it's only spiritual and it's going to happen now. Um, it doesn't quite follow that he would then say, do not marvel at what I just said. The hour is coming when they're coming out of their tombs. Um, so, eternal life is life of the age to come. And what has happened with the resurrection of Jesus is that kind of life has invaded into this present age. And I read earlier that that life has a great deal to do with the fellowship with God, with a relationship with God. In John 17, 3, we all know this. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Um, so there's this, this power of the age that's coming has infiltrated into the old age by the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and we have this resurrection life now, which when you get in you get into Romans six, there's this you know you you have this resurrection life. But Paul will continue on to the ultimate fulfillment of that. If we look in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews seems to understand this idea, because in in chapter six verse four he says, "For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift." and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. So in, in, in that block of Romans 5-8, through 8, Paul speaks of um, being raised in Christ, and living a resurrection life. And he, he'll go on to say, that we have received the spirit of adoption. But then also say, we are waiting for a future adoption as sons. We're waiting for that. We, we, we've received the spirit of adoption. We're waiting for the adoption as sons. 
this all makes sense when you when you consider what eternal life is being a relationship with the Father and the Son and understanding that Jesus came and we have that now, but we have it in part. We have what's called the first fruits of the Spirit or a down payment, a guarantee of our inheritance. We don't have it have, have, have it fully. And this is why when you go back in the in, into the prophets, you will hear some people say, this is the church age. Right now, this is happening now. This is being fulfilled now. And then some say, this hasn't happened yet. It's because in part, it is happening. Because eternal life is the life of the age to come. In which, let me read from, let me read from Jeremiah 31, 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. And he cross-referenced this with, with 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. We know in part now. We have this relationship with God. We have this relationship with, with Jesus now. But we do not fully know like we are fully known. But that is in the age to come through the resurrection. In John 6, verse 45, uh, Isaiah 54, 13 is quoted. And it, and it says, It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That is in part right now. That, that is not in full. When the age to come is here, after the resurrection of the dead, we will be fully we will fully know as we are fully known. But now there is a down payment, a portion of the spirit that is given. And this all seems to make sense. Why we're supposed to live a life that points toward a future glorification. And, and it makes sense in the New Testament because if you've received this spirit, this down payment, this portion, and you are living that out, then there's your assurance of, of God's verdict on your life, of what's going to happen at the judgment in the future. You see this throughout the New Testament's teaching. Your life should be a pointer, a pointer towards a future reality. In John 14, Jesus promised to give the Comforter, the Spirit. And he says that he and the Father will come and make their abode with us. And it's through the agency of the Spirit. Go to Romans 8, and you here you have Paul saying, The Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. But if the Spirit of, of Christ is not in you, then you are none of His. The key to, the key to understanding all of that is, is what Jesus did in his resurrection and the gift that he gave to us in this present age while we wait for that ultimate hope that we have. We have the first fruits of the Spirit, but we are longing to know God just as much as we are known. That's really the context of, of eternal life. Now you can what you can do is you can you can exegete Paul. And you can, if you, if, you, if you exegete Paul in Romans or 2 Corinthians 3 through 5 or 1 Corinthians 15, wherever you want to go, if you exegete Paul and the outcome of your exegesis leads you to an understanding which resembles 
very closely that to the belief of Gnosticism, then you are pretty much in turn saying Paul was a Gnostic. But if you start and understand Paul or Jesus or any Jewish writer from their background, from the historical context, you can exegete and come to that passage with a an, with the outcome of an undeniable bodily resurrection. Uh, remember again, Acts 17, where Paul is reasoning with these Greek thinkers, and he presents the resurrection of the dead. And they mock him. Why would they mock him? If Paul is teaching that we leave this body on earth and the resurrection is something totally spiritual where you escape the realm of material, then this is what they've been hearing most of their lives. There's no reason to mock and sneer. But this guy's come and telling us that bodies are getting up out of the ground. That's, that's something laughable to them. So he goes to Corinth in fear and trembling and decides that he's not going to reason. He's going to preach the gospel. Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, buried, raised on the third day, a stumbling block to Jews because the Messiah was supposed to remain forever and cursed is a, is a man that hangs on a tree and foolishness to Gentiles because they don't believe in a bodily resurrection. I want to do uh, another video that will go in more detail about being fully known and what the hope, what our real hope for as Christians is and should be. And uh, it's doing this study on the resurrection has been, it's been amazing to me because I, 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 I begin to understand some things and grasp hold of some things that are very, very practical that really astonish me and, and give me more of a reason, you know, to, to shape it up, to keep moving, to, to keep looking and, and to, uh, hold fast. So I hope, uh, everyone that's, that's watching this, um, take into great consideration the historical context, the, the Jewish understanding. Be very, be very aware of it. Search, search the scriptures out. Search them diligently. Um, and and uh, Lord be with you all. God bless you guys. Uh, hope to make another video soon. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, it's late here. I'm rambling. Uh, see you guys later. God bless you.